Um, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity to present um, some of the work that we're doing at the NERC Centre for Ecology and Hydrology and also with my colleagues at um, Lancaster University. We've heard a lot from previous speakers about the global uh, pressures on plants and plant production in particular. My background is actually as a soil ecologist and over the past few years I've been working specifically with a number of collaborators on um, the role of plants and their interactions with soils in terms of governing ecosystem services. So I've specifically chosen to focus in on grasslands, which is one of the areas of our uh, focus within the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. This has been banged home quite a few times by the various talks. Bill, um, Bill Davis uh, reiterated some of these issues again. Uh, Sir John Beddington as well, uh, highlighting the fact that we've got convergent problems that we need to tackle. And my position on this is that we need to tackle this all f through excellent uh, plant science, but also through understanding how plants and crops behave with respect to the wider environment as well, and in particular with respect to soil. So all of these convergent drivers, including climate change, the increased demand for land for both urbanization but also for food production are putting pressure on soils and the plant-soil interactions that govern ecosystem services that they provide. I mean, I think in particular the human population pressure and the need for space to produce crops is going to be a huge issue in the future. And ultimately this will impact upon not only the primary productivity uh, and food production aspects of what ecosystems do for us, but also their provisioning of energy, um, fibre, the fact that soils and plants together govern uh, air quality, and at the same time, my particular area of research has been looking at the role of plant-soil interactions in, cropping, in crop systems and natural systems on uh, soil carbon sequestration and greenhouse gas emissions. <clears throat> and of course, balancing all of the needs that we have, particularly with respect to primary productivity, increasing yields, and these other ecosystem services that are equally important and potentially we're going to have to make some decisions about trade-offs in the future. So I'm actually going to focus specifically on UK grasslands as an example of the kind of work we do. We have got projects also in Asia and uh, South America and across Europe with European uh, partners as well. But I thought this, pro this set of projects I'm going to show you results from now demonstrates the kind of research that we are doing um, and hopefully the opportunities for working with plant scientists like yourselves in the future um, to, to seek opportunities uh, to find solutions. So, in the UK, you know, if you're, when, you, when visitors come to the UK, the first thing they say to you, wow, there's so much grassland there with sheep and cows. And, you know, we can estimate that something like 67% of the UK land surface is covered by grassland. And a lot of this is semi-natural, so that means there's, you know, a mixture of species of grasses, and herbs and forbs in, in the community, but a lot of it is also enclosed, high productivity, high intensity, uh, intensely managed grassland with one or two or three different cultivars being uh, selected and used. Only 2% of UK grasslands are now considered as high diversity, and this is like an 80% shift over the past 60 years uh, since we've been intensifying our, our agricultural activity. Now, this has been a need and has been a requirement of our demand for UK and EU production, but there have been uh, consequences of this uh, transition, and I'll, you'll, I'll, you'll see some of these as I present the work. So, very recently, over the past two, three years, um, the broader sort of ecological environmental research community were asked to produce um, a, a document, a tome, really, where evaluating what we call uh, natural ecosystem, uh, it's the National Ecosystem Assessment. It's a bit like a UK version of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment where uh, the top scientists in, in their fields have been asked to pull together evidence to try and define what ecosystem services are and specifically to, to 
uh, allocate you know, the, the importance of those services across different kinds of ecosystems in the UK. And DEFRA have been very keen on this and have supported this with funding and further research. And I think the point of this is to try and link together the underpinning scientific understanding and knowledge with the development of policy in the future for how we go about uh, using our landscapes in the future. <coughs> in grasslands, uh, the ecosystem services are divided into what are called provisioning, regulating, and cultural services, which basically you know, uh, cover a range of different services, including food production, but also, as I say, things like carbon sequestration and biogeochemical functions of ecosystem, uh, different aspects of biodiversity as well. And grasslands in the UK play a very, very important role in the provision of some of these non-food uh, ecosystem services. Uh, for me, <coughs> one of the issues that we have an opportunity to look at and address in the UK and potentially wider across the EU and further is the potential use of grasslands and grassland management as a way to offset some of the emissions of greenhouse gases from fossil fuel consumption. This graph shows <coughs> the, an estimated potential uh, gain we could get in terms of carbon sequestration or greenhouse warming potential mitigation by managing grasslands uh, appropriately to increase the potential for them to sink carbon uh, below ground. Obviously, on the left-hand side, cropland management, we, we've long known that um, low-till agriculture and uh, reducing ploughing depth and potentially reducing, reducing mechanisation and use of fertilisers can also have benefits as well, but there are impacts on productivity. In grasslands, I think there's a pro probably more of an opportunity to, to increase sequestration without necessarily affecting um, the productivity. Peatlands are on here as well. Uh, restore cultivated organic lands. Um, there's potential there as well, but I'm going to focus on grasslands here. Specifically, in, in that, that graph, the, the actual measures that we could, we know we could use now to mitigate carbon losses or to increase uh, carbon sequestration into the soil, obviously through photosynthesis and through the crop, include all of these things here. Um, more careful management of, of water, uh, potentially um, altering the way that we fertilise or use lime on uh, grassland ecosystems, and introducing organic waste and slurries and various uh, farmyard waste as well. That's long been a normal part of agricultural practice in the UK. But there is potential to maximise and op optimise that as well. But one of the bits that I was particularly interested in developing, and we have done over the past five, six, seven years at Lancaster, has been the potential to manage um, plant diversity, and specifically the traits of the uh, different plant species that you find within UK grasslands as a mechanism to deliver the extra carbon sequestration that we think there is the potential for. Um, so what do I mean by plant traits? Well, in this context, it's very ecological, really. It's the sort of biogeochemical characteristics of the vegetation uh, litter of, uh, in terms of the snest above ground material, but also the roots, the turnover of roots, the um, <coughs> riser deposition, the exudation that comes from roots, and how this affects directly and indirectly uh, carbon storage below ground. There's potential, obviously, there for interactions with soil organisms as well, and they ultimately work with the vegetation and the kind of organic matter that goes into the ground uh, to determine the nature of the soil physical structure and the organic matter that's held within it. So <clears throat> the way I'm going to present, demonstrate this is through various levels of research that we've been doing over the past few years. The first level is a sort of UK-wide surveys that I've been involved in and that CH is very strongly uh, involved in. Uh, which we can draw out very, very important information about how management and uh, habitat type affects grassland carbon. And secondly is how we use um, what I call long-term manipulation experiments, where we've got trials with experiments of different 
uh, mixtures of, of species uh, with different aggregated traits that we can then try and actually measure quantitatively how uh, using plant diversity uh, can increase carbon sequestration below ground. And any other level is sort of a microcosm or mesocosm approach where we would um, either in laboratory con under controlled conditions or in field mesocosms manipulate plant diversity and uh, specifically the, 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 the species composition uh, and abundance to alter the nature, the quality and the quantity and timing of uh, how organic matter enters the soil. <clears throat> so every few years in the UK, DEFRA and the Natural Environment Research uh, join together to fund what's called the uh, Countryside Survey. This is a, a huge um, uh, England and Wales wide and Northern Ireland wide uh, survey of vegetation and also soil where we look at lots of different properties of ecosystems and it's partly there, it's partly done so that the um, uh, so that DEFRA can test to see how effective their policies have been in terms of influencing habitat management and um, uh, various uh, policies to, for example, the agri-environment schemes where farmers are subsidised to, to, for specific actions. And what I wanted to show here, is this a laser? I think it might be. Is This is data, therefore, from the Countryside Survey, which um, there are a number of papers now which have used this data. It's freely available on the internet to give you an idea of the, 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 the magnitude of the information that's available. And on the bottom here are the different habitat types that have been broadly, uh, that all of the different data sets have been classified into. And what I want you to concentrate really is on this one, improved grassland. And the area of improved grassland in the UK is as much as arable land, um, if not uh, potentially more, but and compared to other, other grass, uh, habitat types like woodland and bracken, bog, it's, it's considerably larger. Uh, but when we look at this uh, graph shows the carbon content in uh, different habitat types uh, per hectare, improved grasslands have relatively low uh, carbon content compared to, obviously, peatlands, but here arable systems have the lowest. And we know this, obviously, from uh, evidence from the past that, you know, as, as agricultural land has been more and more intensively um, farmed, we lose organic matter from the soil. <coughs> Now, this has implications for productivity in terms of nutrient retention, but also in terms of resilience to drought, because organic matter plays an incredibly important role in protecting and holding on to uh, water as well. So my point here is that even though the concentrations of carbon in grasslands are relatively small compared to other ecosystem types, because they cover such a large area, the actual UK contribution to UK carbon storage below ground of improved grasslands is actually quite high. And my uh, hypothesis is that we should be able to, through judicial management of the soil and the vegetation, increase by maybe even you know, a very small amount, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10 percent carbon storage in grasslands, and that would have a huge implication for UK um, carbon storage. But more importantly, I think, for uh, contribu contributing to the resilience of grassland systems to potential changes in climate in the future. In another st study that was carried out, funded by DEFRA, by, um, uh, that I was involved in, and it was uh, led by Richard Bargett at Lancaster University, where they specifically wanted to look at the effects of different long-term management uh, types, intensities, on uh, grassland properties. So low intensity management, medium intensity management, high intensity, and that means mechanization, fertilizer, more use of fossil fuels. And what we found, unsurprisingly, is that as the intensity of management of the grasslands increases, um, you have lower species richness. Also, you have changes below ground, which are significant to me as a soil ecologist, and will have and should have feedbacks to the vegetation and productivity as well you get a reduction in the amount of fungal hyphae that you find below ground, <coughs> whether they are mycorrhizal or saprobic fungi, having potential feedbacks to productivity. And at the same time, you also, with intensification, see the same kind of pattern that we get with arable lands, where carbon in the soil is reduced with intensity of management. 
So that, those were the surveys that give us the evidence to help us set up hypotheses to test uh, what the mechanisms are at the sort of field scale. And then we've been using uh, field experiments as well. A 20-year grassland uh, plant manipulation experiment in the Yorkshire Dales and a number of other sites, and including in the Lake District as well, where we've looked at sort of semi-improved grasslands where uh, restoration, diversity restoration practices have been instigated. And the purpose of that historically was that um, there was a, there's been a push to, uh, through agri-environment schemes to encourage farmers to increase the diversity of their grasslands uh, to try and return some of the diversity that was previously there when they were hay meadows. And, of course, now we have other questions that we can be answered using these long-term studies, which include uh, the role of different plant species within grassland swards uh, as influences of carbon storage and greenhouse gas emissions as well. So the kinds of plant species that you, we, we're, we've been manipulating and looking at in mixtures and in monocultures in the field, but also in mesocosms, include you know, some quite common species, but also uh, of, of grasses, but also um, different flowering plants as well, uh, other flowering plants as well. But more, very importantly, in the context of this work, is the role of legumes that have a very important association, obviously, below ground with uh, the rhizobial associations that they make with um, end-fixing bacteria, and which have, by and large, apart from clover, been pushed out of lots of, uh, of uh, high-intensity managed grasslands over the past 40 years. So to, to make the measurements that we need to test these hypotheses about fluxes and stocks, we've been using various bits of equipment, including mobile laboratories with... Uh, trace gas analytical capabilities with them, open chambers, and, and that allows us then to do sort of carbon flux budgets uh, from these uh, systems, including <laughs> methane, nitrous oxide, and CO2, diurnal measurements. And we can use these then to model the balance, the carbon balance for the year for a site or for a different treatment. We've also been using um, tracer techniques where we use 13C stabilised labelled carbon dioxide introduced to chambers in the field, in the mixed communities or in these different treatments so that the plants naturally photo, uh, take up the CO2 or photosynthesise, produce the photosynthates and then we can chase it around through the ecosystem, uh, through soil organisms and back to the atmosphere as CO2 to firstly look at how different plant species are processing uh, photosynthates and how they turn over uh, carbon that they assimilate in the daytime. Secondly, then to look at where it goes in the soil and then to see how quickly um, that then returns to the atmosphere and specifically to look at the effect of different species and mixtures of species within swards <coughs> on that turnover, short-term turnover of carbon. So, for example, we've been developing the, the use of 13C tracer characteristics as a way to sort of classify different functional types of grassland plant species. And you can see different uh, groups of plants will, pre will assimilate uh, CO2, and you see the tracer in the leaf tissues, and then it will turn over at slightly different rates. The grass here, the trifolium, Vestuca, and then uh, Brachythesium, which is a bryophyte, hardly as much um, assimilation, but a much longer turnover of uh, photosynthate within its tissues. So we're starting to build up a kind of profile, maybe of a phenotype characteristic or a functional characteristic of these different plants and how they actually behave instantaneously within the sward and on their own. We've also found in uh, mesocosm experiments uh, where we've been growing these six species in monocultures but also in, mixture, in a mixture together that they actually behave differently when they're in monocultures than when they're in mixtures. So these are the different species. This is uh, the net uh, photosynthetic activity. So this, in a species mixture, there's uh, higher um, CO2 uh, sinking into the ecosystem than when grasses are on their own, for example. So there seems to be something that we call complementarity uh, with respect to the different species in, in uh, combination, which influences their carbon use efficiency, and particularly the way that they can potentially sequester CO2. 
There are different reasons for this, but it, that probably is to do with the, the, the fact that the plants are, are forced to, to use resources differently when they're in competition with each other. It's pretty standard ecological theory, and the, this is, demonstrates how this operates. So what this means is there's obviously potential here to use the characteristics or the traits of the plants in combination, if we can understand what they mean individually, to actually try and encourage greater end fixa uh, carbon, fi carbon dioxide fixation through the vegetation. But getting it into the plant is only the first part of the problem, really. What we want to do to have sustainable long-term sequestration of organic matter below ground is get it into the soil. So some of the tricks we use are to trace this 13C as it's naturally gone through the plant into the rhizosphere and into the different groups of organisms within the soil to determine the relative importance, again, of the different plant species and uh, the, the, the role that they have within mixtures on the transfer of carbon into different groups below ground. So, for example, uh, we've got different... We can actually identify different groups of uh, fungi using uh, what we call phospholipid fatty acids, which are biomarkers within the cell walls of the, uh, the membranes of the, these uh, microbes, and then actually trace over time dynamically the, the, the fate and rate of the carbon-13 that's gone through the plant into the roots into these different groups of organisms over time. And for me, what this is starting to demonstrate is not only do the plants have uh, specific traits above ground in terms of their measurable uh, 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 physiology and perhaps the, the, you know, the, the leaf, area, leaf area index and the quality of the litter they produce and the rise of deposition, they also have traits in terms of the associations they have with soil organisms. And I think it's going to be very difficult to separate those out if we want to have an impact in terms of what we do uh, on, at the ecosystem scale when you do include the plants within the, uh, within the natural environment. And there's very clear differences in systems that are more fungal versus more bacterially dominated. Fungally dominated systems tend to hang on to carbon for longer. And as I showed before, less intensively managed systems or more diverse systems with the right species identity within them tend to hang, hang on to carbon for longer and tend to have more fungus in them. So one really interesting finding that we've, we've made over the past few years is that even with a very small... So this is an experiment where we've seeded in trifolium, a trifolium cultivar into uh, a relatively uh, rich... The, well, a relatively diverse uh, semi-natural grassland. And even with very small uh, increase in trifolium, we had a, a significant increase in uh, carbon stocks in the rhizosphere. And similarly, increases in nitrogen stocks, up to 10% after about five or six years. Now, this is quite significant. So obviously something's going on that's very specific to the species identity and the traits of the clover and how it influences the soil. So we looked into this, into the soil, and we did uh, what we call fractionation techniques, where we take apart the soil and mass, and basically uh, mass balance and deconstruct to calculate to, to measure exactly where any extra carbon and nitrogen might be in different fractions, breaking them down into f very small fractions and to larger and larger fractions. And what we found was, when clover was present there was a significant increase in the amount of carbon that was found in very, very small fractions. So that will include, and, and dissolve fractions, so that will include things like um, the glycoproteins and sugars and uh, various bits of carbohydrates that are produced, but also some of the very small particulate fractions as well. And at the same time, there was a slightly reduced respiration from the soil when clover had been present. So there's something going on there. It's influencing the clover. The presence of the clover is influencing the quality and the, and the amount of carbon going into the soil, and that, in turn, was also having some impact on uh, respiration from the soil. We were fortunate to work with some partners at Abate University looking at some X-ray uh, tom tomography of cores taken from these experiments. I know somebody later is going to talk about uh, tomography, probably knows a lot more about it than me, but what their work showed was that um, the presence of the trifolium increased aggregation below ground, effectively, increased the number of uh, micro-peds within the soil. And what that does is it um, 
physically protects organic matter more strongly, allowing there to be a longer turnover of any inputs into the soil. This is probably due to, and there's evidence of this uh, in other work, the nature of the sort of uh, byproducts of this, uh, the rhizobial association that, and the nodules produced on the trifoli uh, trifolium roots, which also produce sort of glycoprotein kind of uh, gel and different agents that we think are probably responsible in part for changing the physical structure of the soil that ultimately protects organic matter. Just a quick note to some other work we've all, uh, where we've been funded through the EU to look specifically at uh, soil biodiversity. It's a, like, it's a six million euro project across the EU where we're looking specifically at the resilience of soil organisms to uh, climate change and land use change. And some work that's already been done by uh, Francesca de Vries, a colleague of mine at Lancaster University, has been showing quite strongly uh, when looking at, at differences between arable and grassland soils that... Uh, grassland soils are generally much more resilient to drought in terms of their capacity to re re achieve or return to pre-drought pre functions and property and status. And again, I think this is probably very strongly uh, <coughs> linked to the role of organic matter below ground, providing some plasticity and some sort of flexibility in the, in the, the system's ability to respond to climatic change. So that's it, really. My conclusions, really, are that there is obviously evidence that plant soil interactions in grasslands, but also more widely, are very, very crucial for ecosystem scale functions that, we, that are beneficial and ecosystem services other than primary productivity that we need to consider as we march forward in uh, our desire to increase productivity. And I think that grasslands in particular have a strong potential in the UK, Europe, and uh, North America as well, and the, and the northern latitudes in particular, um, to be used to promote carbon sequestration below ground. I also think there is a role for increased organic matter below ground, which other than um, mitigating CO2 emissions, but as a uh, buffer against uh, drought and climate change in the future that we really seriously need to consider in the future, especially in the UK, in the south, and wider. But the next step, I think, and you know, I have been working and talking to people around here uh, in the past, is the potential for actually using um, you know, some of this, the amazing science that I've seen over the past day and a half uh, to actually <coughs> perhaps modify or alter or select cultivars, types of grasses and species within grasslands that we could actually uh, capitalize upon to increase the benefits uh, that different uh, genotypes or, uh, have for carbon sequestration. Okay, thanks. Of course, these grasslands are managed primarily for large herbivores, yeah. which is why we've got so much of, of it. And you didn't really talk much about the influence of, of the, the herbivore on the cycling. But one of the things which I was curious to know was whether or not... Uh, is there really a distinction between the nitrogen input into these systems in terms of the carbon return, either through biomass below or above ground, whether it's actually provided through biological nitrogen fixation or the application of nitrogen, which, of course, a farmer would be doing to increase the productivity of the, the biomass? And, and to some extent, you know, what, with those experiments that you showed, I mean, were there, should we say, sort of... Um, intensively managed grassland treatments which would allow you to produce the sort of comparative data of that nature? Yeah, I mean, they, I didn't, I mean, they have controls as well where there are uh, intensively managed uh, fields as well. And, I mean, what happens is obviously if, you've, if you're putting in lots of nitrogen, you do get more productivity, but it's, it's not behaving the same way below ground as systems that have more plant diversity. So, and of course, you know, fossil fuel costs are going up, the cost of nitrogen fertilizers is going up. Maybe it's time to look again at the role of natural uh, end fixation as a more sustainable means to get that nitrogen back into the soil. Uh, Nigel Halford, um, Rob, is that looking? Rob from Stead. Of course, another consequence of um, having stock on grassland is although 
you may get more sequestration of carbon. Some of the carbon going in the atmosphere is in the form of methane, which yeah. is a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So how does that figure in the equation? Well, it's not, it's not, yeah, it's not ideal, is it, really? No. <laughs> There's another one of those trade-offs that I mentioned before. So I suppose the, the role, the purpose of this work is to, de is to demonstrate that this side of the equation, there's potential. But then we've got, yeah, we have to consider the trade-offs with methane emissions, also N2O production as well. Um, yeah, that's a bigger story, isn't it, as ever? I love the way you use the CT to look at the changes in the soil properties. So why do you think there was an increase in soil poor connectivity, and what, why do you think that's important? Well, I think what's the, the it's, and it's not just trifolium, but the legumes have this obviously below ground association, this potentially symbiotic association with N fixers, and they do produce a kind of glue, a kind of uh, snot, <laughs> which does have this effect, and it's documented, and there's evidence of it, to, to increase aggregation in particular. And I think that's what changes the shape, the porosity, and the shape of what's happening in the soil physically, structurally, but there's also these benefits for protecting, physically protecting organic matter as well. So there's a, yeah, I mean, that's a huge potential for using tomography for that in the future. I'd like to do lots more of that across lots and lots of grasslands, you know, if that's what you wanted to hear. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs>